Good, mo good morning, Scott. Um, whenever you are ready to start, uh, and I'm checking real quickly to, to see. I think we're in good shape, so whenever you want to, to get started, we can uh, go ahead. All right, so. Um, um, looks like we're able to start right on time. That's uh, that's nice. Appreciate everybody being here. Joy, appreciate you uh, facilitating, of course, and uh, the first item on our agenda, of course, is call to order. Uh, so, Joy, if you wouldn't mind um, walking us through that. Uh, yes, I'm going, I'll do the roll call. And as we uh, have, have mentioned several times, Sorry, um, wh when we call your name, if you will make sure your camera is on, state your full name and say that you are present uh, for our record. Kelly Bradley. Scott Bruins. Uh, Scott Bruins present. Taylor Baumgartner. Taylor is, uh, Taylor, are you on uh, silent? Have you got your uh, microphone muted? I did, yes. Okay, so, so if you'll state your name and say present. Taylor Bumgardner, present. Thank you. Sarah Burnett. Stacy Earl. Casey Gessenhus. Casey Gessenhus, present. Paula Jolly. Paula Jolly, present. Justin Mitchell. Teresa Nicholas. Teresa Nicholas, present. Valerie O'Rear. William Owens. Amy Smith. Amy Smith present. David Trimble. David Trimble present. And Chairman Bruins, we do have a quorum. All right, excellent. Um, do appreciate everybody um, attending this morning and being on time. Also appreciate it if you are able to keep your uh, videos running, even if you have to step away from view, um, however momentarily. Um, all right, so uh, I believe everybody has a copy of the meeting minutes from July. Um, you would have gotten these ahead of time, um, but I'll give you um, a, a minute or so to look it over and offer any amendments. Scott, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the minutes. David Trimble. All right, uh, we have an emotion. We have a motion on the table to accept the minutes as uh, as stated. Do we have a second? Casey Gaston, you second. All right, all those in favor in accepting our July meeting minutes as uh, posted, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, minutes accepted. Um, all right, uh, we're on our way to item four. Um, Dr. Glass, are, are you in on this uh, in on this call? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. I'll do my best to be brief. It's great to connect with all of you. Um, I guess the, the big news that we're still processing through is um, all the changes that are happening as a result of the um, special session or lack of changes in, in uh, most cases. Um, the department's recommendations to the legislature were focused on four areas. One was around uh, funding stability uh, to create um, uh, a system where we were funded for next school year based on a historical count instead of the average daily attendance method uh, that uh, typically we would use just out of all the disruptions that we're seeing to attendance for a variety of reasons related to COVID-19 uh, this fall. Uh, that's one of the uh, areas that the legislature uh, did take our advice and direction. So what we have is a funding model for next year that's based on either the 1819 or the 1920 counts. So the districts can choose which one of those they want to use. Uh, the legislature will need to come up with some mechanism for handling growth in districts. So districts that are growing in numbers, um, we need to figure out a, a uh, way to solve that. There are a number of ways to go about that, but the legislature's got some time to consider that when they're together um, this spring. A second area that we recommended that the legislature take action was around what we called operational flexibility. Um, the problem was that districts had the 10 NTI days. Uh, they were hesitant to use those again because uh, average daily attendance would be impacted by that um, once they ran out of those days and lots of districts were uh, rightfully concerned about what would happen if they used their days now and then they hit a, uh, an ice storm or a snowstorm in the uh, spring or in the winter um, and what impact that would have. Um, so our recommendation was to add um, uh, more NTI days, to also add what we call temporary remote instruction days, uh, and to allow for 20 of those, to, which would allow the shift to remote instruction at a school, at a grade, or at a classroom level, whereas NTI is a district-wide uh, closure, so pro to provide greater flexibility for superintendents and school boards to decide at what level they need to shift to remote instruction. Uh, and we recommended allowing districts to shift to a hybrid uh, instructional model where some students are in person, some students are out uh, for uh, this semester that we're in. Uh, the legislature only acted on uh, that temporary remote instruction element, so that middle one that I described, uh, the ability to shift to remote instruction at the school, the grade, or the classroom level, and they significantly limited that, especially for large districts, uh, to 20 days. Um, so anytime you have a, a single school that uses a day uh, that counts for for that uh, school, that grade, that classroom, and it counts for the district. So uh, if we really see this start to be used heavily in a district like uh, Boone or Fayette or uh, Jefferson County, they're going to go through those days quickly, whereas another district, uh, it would take them some time. Um, so uh, that's um, that's operational flexibility. We also requested uh, for changes in staffing supports, the uh, expansion of the use of retirees. Uh, the legislature did act on that but in a more limited way than what we uh, recommended. So districts can now use uh, retirees in, in some ways that they couldn't before and there were expansion of the caps on that. But there's a limitation on those positions only through the end of this year. So uh, that's uh, difficult from a staffing continuity standpoint. We recommended they carry it through through the rest of the year, uh, but uh, they, they chose to put a, a limitation on it. Um, and then finally, uh, the element that received the most political attention was the end of the State Board of Education's universal masking requirement and the uh, devolution of that decision to uh, local decision making. Um, I'm appreciative that we have most of the, almost all of the school districts in the state have chosen uh, to continue with universal masking. We only have four districts that have chosen uh, otherwise, and I wish them the best. I hope it works out for them. Uh, but certainly, um, I think school district leaders and school boards and uh, advocates for that were wanting no masks could have been forgiven for that position in um, July and August when we didn't know what we knew now. But now we do. Uh, we know the disruption uh, that we're seeing because of the Delta variant. Uh, and we also know that masks are uh, one of the more effective virus mitigation strategies that we can deploy. So I don't know, looking ahead, uh, at what point it will be the right time uh, to end uh, masking requirements in schools. We all want to get there sooner than later uh, to have this behind us, but certainly 
Today is not that time, uh, and those decisions will be uh, will be locally uh, configured now. My recommendation will be to look at the incidence rates in in communities, and that's a good indicator of what level the virus is present. Um, so the Department of Public Health was uh, interested in looking at some kind of localized metrics that would look at if a district was in the green or the yellow uh, levels on that statewide color coded map. That would be a good indicator that it was safe to move away from universal masking requirements and but of course we're not in that in that condition today with almost all of our counties in the red uh, a few of them uh, flip to orange temporarily and then back to red so um, so now is not the time uh, I don't know when uh, things are going to shift significantly on uh, those um, outbreaks of, co of course no one does uh, if you could predict what COVID was going going to do you should be spending your time in Las Vegas or at, at Keeneland um, uh, nobody, none of us can predict what, what's going to happen with this. But uh, I, have, um, I have heard discussions among epidemiologists and public health experts that talk about uh, that this is largely a, an epidemic of the unvaccinated. And at some point, the virus runs out of unvaccinated bodies to infect. Um, and so at that point, we should start to see an exponential decline in the number of cases. So um, when that happens, we don't know. In other countries, we've seen that happen after roughly um, a four to six week surge. And so uh, we we hopefully are at the tail end of our surge and we'll start seeing that decline, but, but who knows. Uh, other exciting news, uh, we did see uh, Pfizer come forward with uh, compelling data showing that their reduced dosage uh, for children 5 to 11 uh, showed a strong um, immune response among children and uh, very low or um, uh, insignificant uh, adverse effects, certainly not enough to um, when held in comparison with the disruption um, and damage and illness and death that uh, COVID causes. Um, so that's that data is all now with the FDA uh, and, and eyes will be on the FDA now to see if they, are, they will move forward with approval uh, of the Pfizer vaccine and possibly the other two um, major vaccines, the Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson uh, in the next uh, weeks or months. So um, we of course have a large unvaccinated population that we serve in schools uh, with children that are uh, under 11 and then our, our children that are 12 to 18 are uh, among are, are the lowest uh, rate of vaccination group that we have. So we know the Delta variant uh, can infect, uh, can make sick, uh, can kill uh, students, um, and certainly it can infect them and, and make, the, make them vectors of the virus where they carry it to others in our communities. Um, so again, we're, uh, we all want to get to a place where we have uh, vaccines available and we reach herd immunity either through vaccination or the hard way, um, and we can get this, this uh, uh, virus uh, in in our rearview mirror. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, we have been conducting uh, listening tours this past spring uh, to hear the perspectives of Kentuckians on uh, where we are now with education and where they would like to go. Um, so we gathered all that data and 11 listening tours. We had about 1,200 participants. This summer, we had a intentionally diverse group of Kentuckians made up of people from all parts of the state, uh, from different walks of life and, and um, uh, roles in the education system, and uh, we intentionally included uh, groups and people who uh, traditionally have not been involved in decision making in Kentucky. So that was our coalition for advancing education. They sifted through all of that interview data, all those 1,200 uh, participants and their responses, uh, and are now in the process of crafting a future vision for the state that evaluates where our current state is. So where are we now based on the experiences of Kentuckians? And where would we like to be, to be? And of course, the hard work is going to be in bridging that those two, where we are and where we'd like to be. We hope to release that report at the upcoming uh, Kentucky Summit on Education uh, that's being held November 1st and 2nd at the uh, Louisville International Convention Center. Uh, registration is free. We do require uh, proof of vaccination or proof of a recent COVID test uh, for entry, but otherwise it's free. Um, we all are, are also working with KET on live streaming the event because we'll be uh, keeping our attendance uh, lower um, uh, to allow for better uh, social distancing. A mask will be required uh, at the event. Um, but we will also we are also working on that live streaming, uh, hopefully in partnership with KET to make it available for folks that can't uh, 
uh, make it to it. So we uh, uh, are working toward them uh, live streaming and carrying the whole thing. But again, that's that's in development. If not that, uh, perhaps a, a highlights uh, element. We've got an exciting list of uh, speakers uh, and also we'll be using Kentuckians to react to that and also give their perspectives on where we should go forward in the state. One important area uh, for consideration, or at least a couple of important areas for consideration relate to the work of this group. Um, around what are the uh, curricular experiences and learning experiences that students have and how do we make those rich, dynamic, authentic, meaningful, and connected to the kinds of complex work that our students will be asked to do when they leave our schools as adults? And how does our assessment system uh, need to change and shift? And are we now working with an assessment system that is um, a limitation or hindrance when it comes to um, meaningful and deep learning experiences for students? And how can we come up with something better and different uh, that both supports deeper learning and also supports quality instruction by providing actionable and um, uh, available feedback for uh, students and for teachers. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll stop and uh, happy to take any questions or feedback or, or comments that folks have. Otherwise, I'll turn the meeting back to you and let you continue with your agenda. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your update. I always look forward to those and I certainly appreciate you advocating for students and teachers uh, during this uh, special session. Um, I do have a question regarding the the additional remote instruction days um, is the deadline to use those the at the end of the calendar year yes uh, so the, those are available throughout this this school year and the department did provide non-regulatory guidance on uh, everything that happened in the special session this week um, so you can uh, check on um, uh, the department's uh, website uh, or uh, it was delivered through the regular communication channels and the social media channels uh, to the state. Now that that guidance is non-regulatory, meaning that it doesn't have any enforcement authority. It's just the department's opinion on what we think it means and how it should be operationalized. So districts can do with that what they want. Um, but we did get it go into some detail on, um, for example, how those uh, non-traditional instruction and uh, temporary remote instruction days would work for the rest of this year. Gotcha. Yeah, I heard um, altering um, accounts as to whether or not those days would end at the calendar year or, or the school year. But are, are you saying that it's they go until the end of the school year? Yes. Um, OK, well, uh, yes. So run through. So um, uh, so again, I referred back to that guidance document for and, and the bill itself. The bill itself wasn't uh, lengthy. Um, so you can look in the sections um, and see exactly what parameters the legislature put around the use of those days. Well, great. Th thank you so much again for uh, advocating for us. I'll open the floor. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Glass? All right. Well, thank right. you very Thanks much so for much. being here. All right. Bye-bye. All right, next up we have item five, um, our annual election for board chair and vice chair. Um, is Joy, is this something that um, I can facilitate or is that going to, is that vote going to fall under you? Well, uh, we need to ask uh, for a motion and second for uh, from the board members uh, to elect the chairman and the vice chairman for 2021-2022. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of a, a new year for as far as for this uh, governor appointed advisory group. And so we have to have an annually, we have to elect a new chairman and vice chairman. So I'd like just to open it up to the floor uh, for someone to, to make that motion. Uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, keep the ones that you have uh, already present. Uh, uh, as chairman, uh, Scott Bruins and Casey Gessenhus as the vice chairman, but we have to have uh, that in the form of a motion second. I don't mind serving again, but if somebody would like a crack at it, um, I'll fully support anybody who who has that volition. 
I was going to say the same. I don't mind to continue to serve, but I'm happy to let someone else. I make a motion to keep Scott as our chairperson. All right. Uh, thank you, Casey. Are, are there any other nominations for chair? All right. Um, Joy, will, will that will the chair and vice chair will those be separate motions or uh, since, since Casey made the motion for the chairman, we do need a motion for the vice chair. I just didn't want to assume that nobody else wanted the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Teresa Nicholas, I'll make a motion for Scott to be chair and Casey to be vice chair. Okay. <laughs> okay, that will work. All right. Uh, do we have a second to that motion? Taylor Baumgartner, second. All right. Um, uh, so we have a motion and a second on the floor for our uh, election for the chairman uh, and vice chairman. The motion uh, is that uh, Scott Bruins will serve as the chairman for the School Curriculum Assessment and Accountability Council for 2021-2022. And Casey Gessenhaus will be the vice chairman for that same period of time. Uh, we do need to take roll uh, for that for your approval. Uh, Kelly Bradley. Kelly Bradley present. <laughs> and do you uh, approve, approve the motion? Yes, I approve. All right. Um, since uh, Taylor, Taylor Bumgardner. Taylor Bumgardner, uh, yes. Okay, uh, Sarah Burnett, I don't believe she has come yet. All right, uh, Stacy Earl. Uh, Casey, you can't vote. Uh, Paula Jolly. Paula Jolly, I approve. Justin Mitchell, uh, Teresa Nicholas. Teresa Nicholas, yes. Valerie O'Rear and William Owens are not present. Amy Smith. Amy Smith, yes. And David Trimble. David Trimble, yes. All right. Well, congratulations, uh, Scott and Casey. And at this time, I'll turn it back to you to continue with our meeting. OK, thank you, Joy. And um, thank you to the council. I guess I must not be doing something too awful. Um, so appreciate the, the vote of confidence. Um, with that, we'll move to item six. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I did make an error in the information that I gave you. The uh, temporary remote instruction days do expire on December 31st. I just checked the bill. I meant to just put that in the chat and let you know, uh, but I couldn't uh, didn't see it on here. So I just wanted to uh, make the record clear for that. But again, I just encourage everyone to look through it in the guidance. Thank you. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, like I said, I, I heard a couple different things about that and was, was just looking for clarity. Um, so it was the idea with that deadline that uh, the legislature would be in session and could approve additional measures? Uh, I'm not sure that um, I heard their rationale for doing that. I know that there was a significant interest in limiting uh, the number of days that districts uh, could potentially use. Um, of course, if we're still dealing with COVID disruptions when the legislature is back in session, they would have the opportunity to make changes uh, in January or beyond as well. All right. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, yes, item six, advancing education project overview. Um, Ms. Dodd, are you with us? I am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Karen Dodd. I'm the Chief Performance Officer at the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, ben, if you can go ahead and pull up my presentation. Um, I oversee strategic planning and research here at the department. And to that end, part of what we're doing right, we've got a lot of moving parts going on right now. 
And so we put all of that under the umbrella of advancing education and created a project around that. Now, Dr. Glass stepped all over my presentation this morning, but I will go ahead and fill in some other blanks for you. Um, we don't have that up yet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead because I do have it in front of me. So the purpose of the Advancing Education Project is to utilize effective listening techniques and co-create tools and resources with diverse stakeholders for the purpose of meeting the needs of students, families, educators, and community leaders by changing how we educate in Kentucky. Thanks, Ben. If you could go to the next, the components slide, slide number four, please. So we have, like I said, we've got several moving parts here. And so this starts off with the Keep, Stop, Start survey. So I'm going to run through these real quick, and then we're going to look at them as a timeline. Uh, so first was the Keep, Stop, Keep, Stop, Start survey, then the Commissioner's Listening Tour, which he also mentioned. Uh, we have Courageous Conversations, uh, the Kentucky Coalition for Advancing Education, Local Laboratories of Learning, which we also call the L3s, the Student Mental Health Forums, and then the Kentucky Future of Education Summit. So all of this uh, combines together under this project and will eventually lead us to our new strategic plan. On the next slide, you'll see we, we start a timeline and we have Thank you. <laughs> in the fall of 2020 is when that serve that first survey was done. So that was right. That was right when uh, Dr. Glass came on board and this was called the Keep Stop Start survey because we really wanted to get feedback as to what was going on in education that we should keep doing, what things aren't working so well that we should stop doing and what might be some innovative things that we're not aware of that we should start doing. So it was really just those three open-ended questions. Well, as you can imagine, that was um, typically I say in the middle of the pandemic, but it was all <laughs> apparently just at the beginning of the pandemic. And so a lot of the feedback that we received had to do with the pandemic, <clears throat> pardon me, and things that people were seeing or experiencing that they liked or didn't like. So while the feedback was, was good and valuable, we still felt that we needed to hear more voices and uh, find a way to get outside of the pandemic and to the broader needs of education. So from there, we moved into the listening tours. That started in March. Whoops, nope, there we go. <laughs> that started in March and went through uh, May. And as Dr. Glass said, we had uh, 11 tours. Those took, places, took place in each of the co-op areas. Um, we also had we ended up having a couple in Louisville. We had one that was uh, just for Spanish Spanish speaking and another just for our deaf community. Uh, at the same time, we had what we are calling courageous conversations going on. Uh, this was led under Dr. Thomas Woods Tucker and we had uh, interviews going on. So some of our, our leadership staff took place in this. Our coalition ended up taking um, taking on some of this work and, and folks from the listening tour also volunteered to do some of these courageous conversations. And what that is was basically interviews. So uh, we would go out and interview someone, maybe part of education, maybe not. It could be a community leader. It could be a legislator. It could be a parent, could be a student, could be a teacher. Uh, and just asked a couple questions and really dug deep into that. So it might have been something like, what is something, um, what is some feedback that you've received from your school? So whether you're a parent or a student, that question could be asked. And then how did that feedback make you feel? You know, what, what do you think could have been done differently? Do you, did you feel engaged? Really digging in to understand the experience of that person when they received that feedback. So we had various um, questions that we asked and did a, a deep dive in that way. And those were what we're calling those courageous conversations. That all led into our coalition. The coalition started meeting in June. It was made up of 62 uh, stakeholders. They included uh, students, 
parents or families, teachers, school leaders, district leaders, and community leaders. And they all came together and we met every Tuesday evening in throughout June. So that was five meetings. And they looked at all of the input that came from the, the survey, from the, the listening tours, the courageous conversations, and they tried to figure out what is the current state of education? How are people viewing education via all these answers that we have received? Um, how are they feeling about education? What are they liking about it? What are they not liking about it? And from there, we have we put together a current state of education made up of profiles. So in each of the stakeholder groups that I mentioned, so let's take students, there were multiple profiles of a student that were created using all of that input. Same thing for families, teachers, school and district leaders, community leaders. We had profiles for all of those those various stakeholders. From there, it led into a future state of education report. What do we want those profiles to look like moving forward? So if we saw that um, for, for parents or students, that communication from the school system was not adequate, what would it look like? What would they be saying to us if it was, if it was better? And that became a, a future state profile. So we just flip any and anything that was negative, we flipped it to a positive and we want to work toward making that our new reality. So in order to do that, we have to create that chain in the middle that'll get us there. So that's our learning agenda. The learning agenda is going to be picked up by the L3s, which is on the next slide. Uh, and then the L that learning agenda is made up of questions. So basically, you know, how are we going to get from from current to future? What are the things that we need to do? So they're like research questions. If, if we do these things, then we expect this kind of an outcome. So each one of our, our regions is going to, or I'm sorry, each one of the, the districts that are involved in the L3s, you can go on to the next slide. Um, and I think we have, I want to say 16 L3s right now. Um, don't quote me on that. I, I think it's right around there. And each one of them we expect will choose different questions out of that learning agenda to really focus on. And it may just be one or two questions that they'll pick out. Uh, and sticking with the, the communications theme that I had going here, maybe they'll say, you know, we really want to work on improving communication to, communications to our family. So they'll look through that section of the learning agenda and figure out what are some things that we feel that we can do in our district to move from that current state to the future state. And then they'll start working on that and they will be sharing back with the co the state level coalition their findings, you know, what how things are going, what did they put into place to get there? And that will all be shared to up to the state and then shared out um, statewide. Um, next, September through October, we have the Student Mental Health Forums. This is being run out of the Lieutenant Governor's Office, and she's working with some of our student advisory group students. So those who, the, the students that come together to advise our commissioner, um, they are doing some of the facilitating, I believe, of some of these sessions. And this is something my understanding is, you know, we, we were looking at this as a one time thing, but I believe it's going to to live on beyond just these initial um, sessions or forums that they're doing. And that will also be part of the summit. So as Dr. Glass said, the summit is coming up. It's November 1st and 2nd. Uh, and all of these things are going to be shared out. Dr. Glass will be sharing the future state of education. Um, we ended up combining the current state and the future state. So that'll be one report and he'll be sharing that with us at the summit. Um, I believe we're going to have we're going to see the lieutenant governor and some of those students hopefully in a, in a panel so that we'll be able to ask them questions on how everything went there and what they're hoping for for the future. So that it should be really exciting. So um, if you can't attend in person, definitely tune in because I, I think it'll be well worth your time. And that is my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to stay on and answer. All right. Thank you very much. That's got to be a tremendous undertaking to assess the state of education um, within the Commonwealth. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Dodd? All 
right. Well, we look forward to hearing the result of that at our uh, November meeting um, after the, the summit takes place. Um, so Absolutely. thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, we have item seven with uh, Dr. Woods Tucker. Are you with us this morning? I believe you're still on mute, doctor. Uh, Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah, yes, I am here and just ecstatic to be back uh, with you. I can't believe this is my second time, uh, uh, Nathan, have an opportunity to uh, engage in conversation with you all. Uh, now, I have to uh, uh, confess early on, I don't know if I've quite mastered the art of brevity as my colleague Karen Dodd, but I'm going to do my uh, very best, um, Ms. Baumgartner, to do so. So let's try this. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen with you. Now, it worked earlier. It worked earlier, so let's see. Are we, we looking see good? see your screen, Dr. Woods, Tucker. No. Looks good. I think we're probably in trouble for the future. So you have a <laughs> deputy commissioner, retired superintendent who knows how to share a screen too. So you all in trouble going forward. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I'm just having fun with you. It's such a, again, a pleasure to be here uh, to share with SCAAC uh, some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion is initiatives, especially what we're doing with I, what I believe uh, is with our one of a kind equity toolkit. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, at KDE, we began with the notion of context before content. And I cannot think of a better time, a more appropriate time than right now to have that approach. In another few days, uh, we're going to talk about our assessment results. And we know, and I'll, and I'll use it as an example. And we know that we are experiencing a once in a century and hopefully a once in the next 500 years episode. And so we really need to be mindful when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a whole, and a whole lot of other things in education. We need to be mindful of putting context before content. Let's talk about what, what is the intent? What are we trying to achieve here as it relates to diversity equity and inclusion it's quite simple we're trying to level the playing field for all students and the greatest country in the world and the greatest educational system in the world these united states of america we have a history of leveling the playing field whether it was 94 142 or whether it was brown versus the board of education idea or even uh, our initiatives with Title IX. We have a long and distinguished history of leveling the playing field. And, that's our, and that is the context of our work. And again, I ask each person to really focus on the context. What are our intentions? What are our goals uh, in this work as we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about uh, some common language, uh, current and new DEI initiatives and our next steps. And we talked a little bit about some common language uh, the last time in terms of how we uh, as an agency define diversity and it's really going beyond the physical characteristics that we have. Because many times we look at diversity and we define it by the physical characteristics. At your Kentucky Department of Education, we look at personality, learning styles, life experiences, group and social differences, such as this nebulous term race, uh, more appropriate ethnicity, socioeconomic status, class, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, cultural, political, and religious differences, and languages at home when we talk about diversity. So if you look to the right, when we talk about diversity, those are some of the things we look at, again, going over and beyond our skin color. 
uh, equity. You've heard us talk uh, about equity and and primarily. Let's see if I can. Uh, uh, when we talk when we talk about equity, it's not about uh, demonizing people because of their race or indoctrinating students, and that's what we've really come to. I'm only going to talk a little bit about uh, critical race theory because many of you know that that's probably where we're, we're heading uh, to, but we don't spend our time engaging in that because that's not our business getting in, into critical race theory at the uh, secondary level. And I want to uh, quote our commissioner. Um, he was just on and, and may still be with us. And Dr. Glass defines equity in education as fundamentally an effort to ensure that all of our students have the supports they need to meet our academic standards and to reach their full potential as students, citizens, and human beings. And equity focused in education recognizes that public school students, and we all recognize this, they don't come to us all ready to go. They come with us uh, from a variety of backgrounds, needs, supports, and we take those into account when we consider the education of each child. And that's one of the most comprehensive and most effective definitions of equity uh, that we have. Inclusion is the intentional act of creating an environment that fosters mutual respect, uh, respectful relationships in which each student, regardless of their intellectual, social, cultural, geographic background, is welcome, supported, and valued as a fully participating member of society. Uh, many of you also know that I am a, I'm a former middle school principal, and one of the things I really enjoyed and some people thought I was crazy, was supervising the middle school dances, getting three, four hundred seventh and eighth graders together in a gym and dancing. And we know generally boys on the left side, girls on the right side. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to get our students to mingle and to get to know each other because that's one of the, that was one of the few times we could get all of our students together. So when I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think about one, earning an opportunity to come to the dance, two, being asked to dance, and third, being celebrated for coming there. Okay, I see my screen is shifted. Let's see if we can go down here. When I think about the intent of this work, again, it's about closing the opportunity gap. Uh, many times we talk about the achievement gap, and when I look at the work we've done over the years, when I see this huge discrepancy, and you're going to see some scores here in a little bit, and you're going to, and, and we've seen them historically, uh, gaps in uh, student scores. And we have to put it in, in, in uh, context, and I ask that you do that. But I also would ask, and I challenge people, to focus on removing the opportunity gaps because when we look at the achievement gaps and they are they they're just they're disturbing in, in some cases but what happens is unfairly places the blame on kids and their families it simply implies that children are not achieving or teachers or principals and superintendents are not helping kids to achieve where they should be and it's the kids fault or the school's fault but I say to you that it's really about opportunities. If we work hard to close these opportunity gaps, we will draw attention to the conditions and the obstacles that students face throughout their educational uh, careers. Therefore, it's accurate to place responsibility on an, on an, an equitable system that I'm really, really proud to be here at KDE that we're trying to dismantle this inequitable system. This system that's not providing the opportunities for all kids to thrive and succeed. And I wholeheartedly believe once we uh, get rid of those opportunity gaps, all of our kids will succeed. So now let's move on here quickly to discuss our current and new diversity, equity, and inclusion programs across the Commonwealth for school districts. 
and it starts with our toolkit. Imagine that toolkit uh, that that your parents had. You know, you go in the basement, you go on the front porch, whatever your toolkit was, and you went and you got that tool to fix whatever you needed that was appropriate to be fixed at home. And so that's what we've created here or here at the Kentucky Department of Education. It is really embraced by a multi-tiered system of supports. These tools are fantastic. But if we don't address the social, emotional, and learning needs of our students and staff, these tools would not work. Again, so proud to be here at your Kentucky Department of Education that values this whole child. Uh, as I talk, uh, continue to talk with my children, I have three teenagers and I talk with our kids in the Commonwealth, they really don't talk a whole lot about, about the academic loss. We have great kids, great teachers, principals, uh, parents are sending their best kids to school. As I used to joke, they don't keep their best kids at home. They send their best kids to school. And so it's um, it, it, it's great when we talk with kids. They don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the academic loss. They talk about ensuring uh, that we address the social and emotional needs and kids who are back in school. They're happy to be back uh, socializing with their friends. And as Commissioner Glass has said, let's really uh, deploy, let's employ those types of things that are going to keep our kids in school, uh, vaccines, masking, and so forth. But here are some quick tools in our toolkit, uh, starting with our high quality academic standards. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about the funding we have for our high quality instructional resources that we're going to make available for all of our schools here in the Commonwealth, our equity dashboard that I'm exceptionally excited about the equity playbook which is moving along and the a4 module and the k to kentucky academy for equity and teaching uh, program so let's go ahead and discuss those things here uh, as i mentioned uh, the last time uh, we start with the kentucky academic standards implementation again that's the first defense in removing those opportunity gaps because these standards uh, should, should ensure equitable access to our pre-K through 12th grade students, regardless of what school they're in. And our folks in the Office of Teaching and Learning and, and Assessments and across the entire agency are working hard to ensure our standards are in place. And certainly want to thank uh, Mickey Ray for the work she's doing and our whole team and our teachers here and other folks across the Commonwealth who are ensuring that we have updated high quality standards. Uh, we're, we're very uh, fortunate to be uh, associated with the Council of Chief State School Officers. They have provided us over a quarter of a million dollars to establish uh, pilot projects to ensure that our school districts have high quality instructional materials to go along with these standards. And these materials are, are engaging, they're relevant, and their standards align, and that's the beginning, ensuring that these materials are aligned to the standards, the grade level standards, and they focus on feedback and reflection. And they also ensure that our students, regardless of their background, when we talk about diversity, are reflected uh, in these curricular resources. So again, a big thank you to uh, CCSSO uh, for their generous support. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, our focus on the whole child uh, it's important that we look at the academic uh, progress of our students. That's very important, but we also need to pay attention to the behavioral and social and emotional learning that's happening. So let's talk about our new initiatives. Uh, we here at uh, KDE, we have our diversity, equity and inclusion strategic plan. Uh, this plan uh, lists all of our strategic initiatives in the Kentucky Department of Education. Certainly want to thank the work uh, that Karen and her team are doing. And so what we're doing here, uh, instead of uh, working in isolation or in silos, when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, we are coming together. And it started really with those courageous conversations uh, that Karen talked about. So we've worked extremely hard to bring all of our resources under one umbrella so we're not duplicating uh, the services there. And so when we launch our diversity, equity and inclusion website, you'll see all of the DEI initiatives across the agency. And these uh, services will be free to all of our public schools across the Commonwealth. So we're excited 
uh, about that. Uh, they are time bound. You know who's responsible. You know what the initiative is. You know who's responsible for it, and you'll know when that initiative will be launched and completed. Again, uh, uh, this toolkit uh, all will all encompass uh, these types of things that will help us uh, reduce these achievement gaps. Uh, one of the uh, big tools in the toolbox is our equity playbook. Uh, that is an initiative in which 70 of our 170 districts have already signed up. Now we can talk about these opportunity gaps that exist all day long and we can admire the data, but the fundamental question is what are we doing about it? And since the last time we talked, I want to give you uh, some more details about our equity uh, playbook. The playbook is built around five research based pillars for success in removing opportunity gaps student achievement. Uh, we will look at each school district and each participating uh, school within that district. We'll look at their student achievement data and we'll be able to pinpoint any gaps that exist amongst our various student groups. Do we have a group of students um, that's overrepresented in our more rigorous courses? Do we have a group of students that that's underrepresented in our student achievement group. And so uh, this will give us real time data with that. The same is said with disciplinary practices and procedures. Are we seeing that a certain group of students are being more disciplined, are being disciplined more than other students, are being uh, more harshly disciplined? Again, real time data, because what we do know, uh, if students, all students are provided opportunities to be in more rigorous courses, they achieve better, uh, they develop greater grit, they persist, and they graduate. We also know if we're disproportionately suspending kids, they're out of school, they're not going to learn. Same thing can be said for uh, suspensions and expulsions. The third pillar here quickly, high quality programming and teachers. We need to engage all of our students. You cannot teach a kid to high jump if you never raise the bar. And so we're looking at all of our student groups and what type of programming they're in. Uh, do we have uh, a situation, for example, uh, only 5% of our Asian students are in career technical education programs? We know that our Asian students, we know that our students with disabilities, we know our higher achieving students really want to be in some of these really rigorous CTE programs. And so we're looking at that. Also, distribution of funding and resources. When we talk about equity, this simply means that we're not going to give or we shouldn't give every school the same thing because student populations are different. How are we distributing our resources to meet the needs of our students in our schools? And lastly, and probably the most important of the five pillars, school culture and climate. Uh, we'll have real time annual data looking at school culture and climate. If students feel great about coming to school, they're going to learn and their parents and research also tells us that their parents are going to be more engaged. Another exciting tool. I mean, it's 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 awesome here. It's our equity dashboard. Uh, we're working uh, with Karen Dodd. We're working with Melody Cooper and we're working with the other folks in assessment to really provide each of our school districts. Uh, an access to access to real time data based upon uh, the students, whether the student has an IP, uh, whether the student is chronically absent, uh, whether the student um, is out of school from suspensions, in school suspensions, overrepresented, underrepresented in different groups. And there are more, this is just a sample here, there are more um, uh, categories that we have. And as soon as we see something that's not looking right, there is an automatic warning to that respective school and that district that we need to look at this particular group and ask the question, why? Why is this certain group uh, of students, for example, um, our female students, why are our female students uh, underrepresented in the STEM classes? So this will be the first time you'll have real data and an early warning system. Really excited about that. Uh, we already have uh, uh, run a demo with uh, school folks in the field, so just excited about that work. 
Another item that we're extremely excited about is our partnership with the Council of Post-Secondary Education and Workforce Development. And this is the uh, completion of a framework designed to provide individuals in education with knowledge, skills, and attitudes really to increase their effectiveness in working with people from diverse backgrounds. And I just don't mean that uh, we're talking about our uh, teachers and support staff in our K-12 schools. We're working with our pre-service teachers. I spent uh, the weekend last week uh, with uh, KEA's Kentucky Education Association's um, aspiring uh, educators conference and aspiring uh, minorities uh, who are interested in education. And we talked about this tool here. Wouldn't it have been great uh, in our teacher preparation program that we had modules uh, around the areas of acceptance, action, awareness, and acknowledgement as it relates to different groups of students, different people, because uh, Kentucky um, is a, a, a very tight knit state, but it's also a diverse state and it's constantly growing. I mean, you have Louisville and you have Fort Thomas, you have other places that are different and we have different cultural norms, but this will provide our educators and future educators uh, with modules and we're using a train to train model to help uh, ensure that this is uh, done right, that students and whomever and, and whomever who uses these uh, modules uh, have a deep understanding of it and we have a training date uh, that's coming up as well. So again, all of these resources are uh, school districts can vol volunteer to use them and more importantly, they are free. A uh, couple other things here. The last time I spoke with you uh, about our uh, policy scan in which we're asking every person beyond our local superintendents and our district staff um, and our students, we're asking everyone in the in the Commonwealth to please log on to our website and give us uh, your thoughts and your opinions on what's working well and what we can do also to improve diversity equity and inclusion in the Commonwealth. And we're going to highlight many of those efforts as well. So excited about that. Then also uh, we are well underway with the funding for the Kentucky Academy for Equity and Teaching. I talked about that last weekend as well uh, at KEA. And this program here, again, is open up for students and participants from all different uh, backgrounds, not based on uh, not solely based on ethnicity, and I think it's going to be no. In fact, I know it's going to be a major game changer in terms of recruiting uh, not only minority teachers and uh, and other teachers from different socioeconomic backgrounds, but also along with recruiting, it's going to be a huge game changer in terms of retention and the development of teachers. So really excited about that. A uh, quick uh, thing I will mention: uh, we awarded ten. $50,000 grants. Uh, we made that announcement a couple months ago, and we're really excited about uh, our, our our new associate commissioner over in the Office of uh, Teacher Effectiveness and Licensure, Dr. Byron Donnell. He and his folks are doing a great job, so we're excited about that. Uh, how are we doing with time? Oh, we're doing just fine. Okay, now. Yeah, keep uh, it going. Keep I can go all day with this, so this is <laughs> exciting work. So one of the fundamental questions uh, that we we really uh, have pondered is that how can we ensure equity every day? Because this certainly should not be an event. An event. This should be something we're doing all day, every day. And I've enjoyed uh, my conversations with uh, Dr. Roger Cleveland, uh, who's with EKU and as well as my colleague that I get to work with every day, uh, Dr. Uh, Sweeney. And we talked about some of these things here in terms of ensuring equity every day. And we believe um, along with our friends at AASA, it begins with accountability. We need to hold each other accountable for equity. We need to create those environments and those cultures where we can have courageous conversations um, about uh, inequitable practices that exist. And we also need to train for transformation with professional learning focused on cultural humility, uh, self-examination and implicit bias. Those uh, A4 modules look at implicit bias because we all come to the table. I don't care 
who you are or where you're from, we all come to the table with implicit biases on something. Doesn't mean that we're racist, but it does mean we have a certain mindset, a certain bias that we carry with us. That's human nature. We also, again, need to continue to provide mental health and behavioral support for students and teachers. Please, please continue to check in with your students and your teachers to ensure uh, that they're doing okay. They're doing the best we can. And it just breaks my heart when I hear about anyone struggling during this pandemic, let alone dying of COVID. And you all know we've lost some very good educators within this last year due to COVID. And I would challenge people to not only create an office for equity, opportunity, and achievement, but go back to your districts. You know, do what our brave Kentucky Board of Education did, supported by, by our very own commissioner, Commissioner Glass, in passing a resolution supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this really helps everyone to start thinking about these important initiatives. And work hard. We know it's difficult, but it's hard work. Try to ensure diverse staff and diverse perspectives. And again, please go beyond. When they ask you about diversity, go beyond skin color. We have to go beyond it. This beautiful state, this beautiful country is so diverse in thoughts, opinions, and other things that uh, make us uh, a great country. So please always ensure you have diverse opinions and diverse perspectives. As I said earlier, please challenge yourselves. If you don't create a policy, at least have a resolution uh, covering curriculum and instruction, communication, and enforcement. And lastly, we as adults need to model these core values so that the community the community can see us and we need to communicate these policies to our community. What I look for when I come in, when people ask me uh, to, let, to take a look at some of their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, I'll say, let me take a look at your written policies, your resolution. How about your, st your strategic plan? What about your building plan? All of those things are important. Those things, unfortunately, that get measured are those uh, those things that get done or those things that get measured uh, too often. So again, uh, what is your true commitment to this? And again, I said I wasn't going to talk too much of, about this, but I kind of have a feeling uh, over the next few weeks, this is conversation has died down, um, but it, it's probably going to come back. But I will say this to you. When uh, our folks ask me about diversity, equity, inclusion, I say, I don't think we know what it is. Certainly not in K-12. It's not uh, much of our, our business in terms of what we do there. But however, the question oftentimes is, uh, are schools in Kentucky teaching CRT? The answer is no. CRT is a research methodology normally taught in graduate schools. Another question we've gotten, if students in Kentucky aren't necessarily being taught CRT, what are some major tenets that are being taught? The answer, Kentucky students are taught teaching hate uh, for others or, or of others based on skin color or history is unacceptable. And if, again, if I'm a building principal and administrator, that's happening. That person is not teaching, that person not serving in my district, in my building anymore. Dis likewise, discriminatory oppressive or offensive behavior prohibits the ability of students to strive and saying one race is superior to another is not and will not be tolerated in Kentucky schools or any school or shouldn't be tolerated in any school in America. Uh, a couple other things, current conversations regarding CRT. There are numerous examples of educators teaching and discussing significant historical events where discrimination and or oppression uh, we're at the center of those events and, stat and a statute exists that maintain as such in KRS. We, I mean, are we going to go against our own laws? Can we no longer talk about genocide, for example? Furthermore, we see educators engage students in conversations regarding current events that impact their lives, their community, and our country. Are we going to have students walk in and say, oh my God, we can't talk about this? Again, we're now going against uh, the statute, the KRS statute. We're also going against our long held belief in our beautiful Commonwealth that our districts are, our schools are locally controlled. And lastly, the Kentucky Department of Education recognizes a goal to prepare all of Kentucky students for civic engagement. 
the KDE is also working on guidance for educators that will help uh, teach students agency and empathy through social and emotional learning. And those are the important things that we want to achieve here at your Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, one other question, are school districts mandated to follow KDE guidelines regarding DEI? Is there a monitoring system or document? The answer is no. Our job is to be a resource. It's to be a resource. It's not to monitor. It's not to tell people what to teach, how to teach. We do. Uh, we give you a framework in our standards so that uh, answer is no. Kentucky is a locally controlled state. And the important part here as I get ready to close is how can we educate the community on these topics here? We can educate through presentations and guidance documents using implementation uh, and science and feedback loops and begin with allies. You're not going your foes. You're not going to convince your foes or people who think otherwise. There's no way you're going to convince them, but begin with your allies. And I believe in my heart of heart that our folks here in, in Kentucky, the majority of our folks here want all of our students to succeed because when all of our students succeed, the Commonwealth succeeds, especially economically. And listen to stakeholders. You heard uh, Karen Dodd talk earlier about these listening tours. Those listening tours were, were just very powerful. Uh, and our student advisory committee, huge, the uh, uh, Commissioner Student Advisory Committee and listening to our students. And, and I really believe, folks, that that's where it begins and ends, listening to our students. And also uh, having a student on the Kentucky Board of Education and a teacher, huge. Those are prime examples of our commitment to listening to our stakeholders. And also, we need to be in a place where we challenge, where we can uh, challenge each other and discuss uh, solutions and working uh, together as we go forward. Then also, prioritize the implementation, again, of a multi-tiered system of support. Care before content. Care before content. And then we do and we continue to do not so much of a great job in telling our heroic stories. There are great things happening in the Commonwealth across all of our districts in regards to helping students succeed, helping staff members succeed, pitching in when necessary. So please, please uh, continue to highlight and tell our stories because if we don't tell the great stories that are happening in our districts, who will? Uh, some next steps here, and I'll wrap up uh, with some next steps. Uh, we have funding uh, for the A4 modules. Uh, we are going to begin releasing the first module here in a couple of weeks. I am so uh, ecstatic that Lieutenant Governor Coleman, uh, as well as Commissioner Glass, our board president, and I had an opportunity to help with the creation uh, of these modules and we are working with our educational co-ops to provide training uh, for our local school districts in the co-ops. The equity toolkit training will be October 20th and 21st. We're still working on the location given this pandemic. Uh, we're trying to decide whether it's gonna be in person or we're gonna to continue to do this remotely. And then we, are, uh, we ask each co-op uh, to uh, uh, Give us two people, if you will, uh, to assist us uh, in this training so we can really meet the needs of our folks in the local school districts. And along with that, excited about this, uh, with the support of our folks at uh, KDE uh, in our finance office with Commissioner Glass and, and really all of our folks across KDE, we're able to employ one diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator for each of the co-ops to help this work uh, get infused in our local schools. So we're happy about that. And um, we will uh, start setting dates uh, to, uh, to train district and school level uh, leaders on the entire equity toolkit. So excited about that. A lot of work going, and um, I have no doubt that this is uh, one of the most comprehensive and will be one of the most effective approaches to begin to close the opportunity gaps that exist here in Kentucky and across this great country of ours. Thank you. All right, All right. Thank, you. thank you. 
Dr. Woodstecker, uh, I'm especially appreciative of your statement um, about CRT as a social studies teacher in Kentucky. Sometimes that that comes up, but like you said, um, I feel like a lot of that uh, chatter is sort of dying down right now. So, yeah, um, do we have a couple minutes? Uh, do we have a couple minutes to take a few questions? Uh, any feedback that you may have? All right, we'll open the floor. All right, well, we uh, appreciate uh, uh, the informative presentation. Uh, it sounds like uh, you've been, your office has been really busy uh, over the last few months. Oh, yeah. Um, so appreciate, I look forward to seeing the results of uh, those conversations. And I especially appreciate the, the fact that um, the, the, this whole concept of uh, equity and diversity, that it's uh, it's it's not hand, heavy handed. It, it's uh, more organic and it's it's more um, uh, cultivated. Yeah. yeah, and I think even in this, and I appreciate that even in this highly charged political climate, when you look at the the work uh, that it will take to successfully launch and implement uh, our our equity toolkit, seventy of our districts signed up, volunteered to. Uh, participate in the work uh, for the now remember the equity uh, dashboard is free it's your data it stays in your district uh, but the other work we have I mean it's just just fascinating to see so many districts uh, sign up for this work and uh, just just really great uh, to have uh, 70 districts signed up for the equity playbook which will look at those five pillars that I talked about earlier even in this, again, in this politically charged climate. So excited about that. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Woods Tucker. Um, next up, we have uh, Ms. Jones with the ACT online. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so very much for being here with us today. Um, my name is Helen Jones, and I'm the branch manager in the Division of Assessments and Accountability Support. And with me today is my colleague, Shara Savage. We're here today to share information with you regarding the state administered online assessment. We're looking at the content assessments which were administered online and then Cheryl share will share information with you uh, specifically around ACT. We, we're looking for, for your feedback. Let me know if you guys can see my share my um, Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. OK, perfect. Yes. So just by way of background, we shared this information with the commissioner's student advisory as well as with our district assessment coordinators, advisory members. Um, I want to begin by discussing the progression of online state assessments in Kentucky. In early spring 2020, um, the state of Kentucky successfully administered an online field test in reading, mathematics, science, on demand, um, editing mechanics, and all grade bands. And then, of course, as you know, we um, were shut down because of COVID, and so we did not have state administered um, assessments um, for K prep. We just had the field test. Then in the spring of 2021, um, the state administered online field test um, in social studies. But we also, during that same period in 20, spring 2021, we had successfully administered um, state assessments in K prep. Sorry. Okay. 
So as you can see, um, KDE and our vendor Pearson was able to track the number of tests that were successfully completed um, during this time. This slide uh, shows that over three days, within three days, as um, that during the testing window, this was May 10th, 11th, and 13th, there were over 100,000 tests. This is online assessment. This is just online, just purely online. We successfully administered 100,000 tests per day, and this is just for just those three days. And then for the entire testing window for K prep, this is strictly K prep, the state successfully administered 1,147,025 online assessments. Additionally, we also conducted a social studies field test. And for the social studies field test, there were an additional 53,536 field tests that were, administ that were administered um, during this same time period. So this is what I would like to do. Um, for those of you who've had any experience with online state assessments, um, we would like to hear from you. We just want to hear, I want to take a moment during this presentation and just describe your experiences with online testing. So if you don't mind opening your um your mic and just talk to me about your personal experience if you've had any at all how did it go in your building if you want to put something in the chat please feel free to do that as well we just we just really want to hear how it went for you or if you had any experience at all um, ms nicholas uh i hate to put you on the spot but i'm really curious as to your perspective not a pro I actually lost my mouse. I couldn't find my mouse in order to unmute myself. Um, so it actually went well for us um, because of, so we'll give kudos to the pandemic for this. Uh, because of the pandemic, of course, and we were virtual learning across the board, we had purchased and became a one-to-one -one district. So we had okay. a device for every student, a Chromebook for every student. Um, so it was easier uh you know i'm glad that we hadn't done online before we were one-to-one -one. otherwise it would have been a nightmare in scheduling and just trying to figure out the logistics and getting the kids in to test but because we were one-to-one -one, it actually went uh very smoothly uh we did not encounter knock on wood because i sure don't want to do it in the future we did not encounter any major issues uh, with testing. It went well as far as as the technology was concerned and that that platform online testing. Now, I will tell you uh, a few things that probably caused uh, the biggest concerns and some hiccups, and it was just because it was different, um, was tied into the accommodations. Um, and because I'm not so sure until we got ready to test and I did admin code training again and stressing again the accommodations that were permitted, I'm not so sure how clear folks were in that when they were holding ARC meetings and identifying accommodations that if they had identified text reader as the accommodation, then that's what the kids were going to use on the K prep. They thought they still had a little bit of flexibility in either doing the text reader or going ahead and giving them a human reader if they thought that would work better actually during k prep and i was like ah no iep is in control if it says text reader then that's the accommodation they get so other than a few minor hiccups like that it actually went very smoothly for pulaski county that's good to hear that's good to hear anyone else of course helen i will add and and i think this crew knows this i'm i'm the representative for the dax uh, so I am a district assessment coordinator, but I'm also the district technology coordinator in Pulaski County. So if it hadn't gone well, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have any hair left. It would be bad. 
and we would have heard about that. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for sharing. Anyone else? Well, yeah. OK, go on. Yeah, um, we're not. I'm, I'm in Scott County. We are not a one to one district, so we were a little bit technology constrained. Um, I don't think it presented itself as a problem. Um, we just had to be a little bit strategic in how we we scheduled everybody and, and balanced it with, you know, daily instruction. Um, you know, it did require us to repurpose some of our Chromebook carts for, you know, from learning in the classroom to to assessment. But uh, overall, I, I don't think that it was a problem. Uh, do you see this as more of a permanent transition? That is our goal. We, we, we're we looking to see. That's why we're kind of look, going out right now um, the, to actually basically see how things went and basically looking at that and moving in that direction that 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 is um, something that we're exploring basically right now and um, interesting um, that you would say that because my colleague Cher has some additional information that she wants to share with you about um, some additional thoughts that we're having so I'm going to turn it over to Cher at this time to discuss um, specifically the ACT. So Shara. Thank you, Helen. Um, so uh, thank you all for your, your feedback. Uh, I'm certainly glad to hear that uh, things went really well for you in the spring, Con but, you know, considering the, the pandemic and the, the situations that we were in uh, in the spring. So uh, I'm, I'm encouraged uh, to hear the positivity uh, from you all. So uh, with that being said, yes, uh, we are exploring and, and going to talk about um, the ACT online. So um, the ACT began as an option uh, and it's still an option at this time um, in the spring of 2017. Um, of course, the numbers were small uh, during that first first year of, of an option of a, an online ACT. We only had about 303 students to take advantage of the online ACT. But as the years have progressed, and as you can see from your slide, um, we have increased in that number. And in last year, uh, during the pandemic, you all found uh, the flexibility with the online testing. And um, we, we tested 13,959 students successfully online. <clears throat> so uh, with that being said, Oklahoma uh, is another uh, state who, who administers the state uh, version of the ACT. And now, um, Oklahoma, this is what they are doing. This not necessary not to say this is what we are going to do, but um, they they have uh, mandated that um, the ACT be given um, online uh, and has done has it has been mandatory in Oklahoma for the last three years. Um, in the most recent uh, spring administration, over 99% of their examinees did test online. Um, you know, in the in the early years, um, the districts and in, in schools, just like many of you uh, with the K prep, uh, expressed concerns about devices and network capabilities, um, and they were worried about those scores uh, being lower. Um, and um, so as as the years has went on that, you know, they they are uh, becoming increasingly uh, solidly online. Um, now they're still even with with the big push from Oklahoma to be online. They uh, still have a small number of paper uh, tests from uh, from that from accommodations that, that simply cannot be accommodated online. So they they still do see some paper testing, but it but it is rare. 
So uh, given that, what so what what would be a what would be the pros of, of moving the ACT online? So students are already familiar with the, with the test NAS system because that's what we use for KPREP. And as you've seen from from this, the slides from Helen, that um, the online testing platform TestNav was successful. And from what we're hearing from you all, it, the spring was successful. Um, and the beauty of, of the ACT being online, it gives you more flexibility in those days versus paper you just have that Tuesday. Uh, and then uh, then I make up then another, you know, in a couple of weeks and you have the makeup, the one day um, makeup. So it definitely increases your flexibility in testing days. You have uh, a, a less risk of security breach because you don't have all those paper materials to secure and handle. Um, and then, you know, shipping er errors, we had a lot of we had not a lot, but we, we had several incidents where materials didn't get to, to where they uh, needed to be in time. And so we were scrambling uh, to, to make that happen. Um, for students uh, with the MyACT, they they do receive their scores uh, sooner. Um, and um, so those are some of the uh, pros uh, for the districts and schools. Now there there is um, some uh, cons and there are technology issues that do happen, but ACT uh, just like KPREP does have a technology technology team and they they work uh, very hard during um, during those testing times to resolve any issues that you may be having. Um, you know, and you know, you may have connection uh, issues and, uh, and and things like that. But those those are things that generally are known about ahead of time and can be resolved one way or the other before the testing begins. Uh, because, you know, as ACT has that, you know, you prep for your your uh, you prep your technology uh, prior to the, the administering uh, an online assessment. <clears throat> and, you know, sometimes you do have less control over what the student is doing, um, but that's where, you know, good monitoring um, comes into play. And some some kids just favor paper, you know, and, and some adults, you know. Um, but with the test nav, it's, it's really come a long way in making it user friendly for those that do favor paper and um, and some of those um, comes in in the uh, way of pros for students. Um, you have the highlighter, you have the color contrast, you have the line reader, uh, you can zoom in, uh, you can mask your answers and you have an uh, answer eliminator. And you're able to flag a question for review. If you if a student's in there and they're, mm, I'm not sure about this one, you can flag it and you can come back to it. So for the one pro or with the one con that, that I did mention, uh, you know, some people disfavor paper and the you know, parents, students say, well, oh, this is going to lower my score. Um, ACT uh, com completed uh, a study. Uh, to to combat that or to you know find if if that would be the case be when they started um, in 2013 they did a comparability mode study of paper versus online um, and so the in 2013 the fall of 2013 uh, was a timing study and then um, for um, for 2014, they did a mode comparability study in the spring. And then lastly, in the spring of 2015, they did a second mode comparability study. So in, in 2013, uh, on the timing, um, they found that uh, uh, they, they thought that 
extra time would be needed in uh, the the reading and the science test. Uh, they they thought that they would be um, more. It would it would give them more um, time uh, to 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 adequately um, complete those tests. So they increased uh, the test, the reading and the, the science by five minutes from that study in 2013. And then uh, in 2014, the results showed that although a little difference had been found in the two modes in terms of test reliability, correlation among the tests, effective weights and factor structures, uh, item scores and and the test scores tended to be higher and the emission rate, the omission rate tended to be lower for the online group. So that more students were not leaving um, the uh, test answer or test question blank. So, but what they did find is that the extra five minutes was not needed uh, for the reading and the science. And so it, a decision was made to remove that um, for the 2015. So the 2015 uh, showed that the students perform uh, the same as across the modes on the science test, but still higher on the reading test, even without that five extra minutes. So with 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 that, um, the uh, Tennessee, who is another state uh, that gives the ACT as part of their state uh, program, they have decided to transition fully online. Now they're at this point they're not mandating, but they are announcing this fall in their training that. Um, that they are going to encourage students. They're going to do a transition approach where this spring they're going to encourage uh, the schools to fully test online. And um, if a school or district wants to test on paper, they're going to encourage them to only select one paper um, date and then minister the, the rest uh, online. And their goal is to be um, 100 percent online uh, by spring of 2023. So given um, for those of you who have had uh, experience with online testing, what are some of your experiences and feedback uh, with the ACT exam online? So feel free to to pop your in chat or come off mute. And, we really want to hear your feedback. I know my students have really appreciated um, just how quickly they are able to receive their scores. Um, so that um, that that early feedback I think is helpful uh, as far as their decision making and college choices and whatnot. Right, right, because a lot of them are just just. Um, just waiting on that, like you said, so they can make a decision on college and, and those those scholarships and things that they apply for. So yeah, it is it is nice for them. So um, the 20, I think it was 2013, 2014 um, studies, those really didn't look at one of the things that the newest studies are doing is those really didn't address equity um, concerns. And what we're seeing in higher ed is the students that are most negatively impacted by online testing is the students that we need to not be negatively impacted by online testing. So it basically increases the um, it, it increases the gap of test scores. Um, and given the state's charge of diversity, equity and inclusiveness, I find this push really interesting because really the online testing does exactly the opposite. It um, creates a bigger divide between the haves and have nots. Um, students that have technology in front of them all the time do um, statistically better on online testing. Um, those with needs that aren't directly met in schools on a daily basis tend to fall even further behind. 
And this is another way to basically highlight their um, lack of success. And then that is negatively also has negative ramifications. Um, so, I mean, in, in the way of like getting it done, absolutely, online is the best. In serving certain students' needs, I mean, I can speak for Fayette County during, um, during COVID and when we were online, we literally had students that never got a laptop in their hand the entire year mm -hmm. for an entire online, <laughs> when they were completely online. We didn't have laptops. Um, and so it works great in small places or schools that can do one on ones that can make sure everybody has the technology. Um, but, you know, it's I mean, again, my biggest concern is even if you make sure everybody has it, it is definitely, um, you know, it's a classic cultural capital um, dilemma. And so equity should be a concern. Um, there's no way the schools can address the equity part of it because you'd have to make sure that every student had the same number of hours or same experiences on a computer with these kind of testing things. And we know for a fact those that are in higher income, more educated households um, do test prepping online. So they have practice with this. And one of the kind of levelers, especially as we're seeing in higher ed, was the fact that the pencil and paper allowed them to kind of take that take that component away. So I just I just personally in measurement and testing is my specialty. I mean, we've dealt with this in multiple studies. I mean, it's I don't know you can't get rid of it unless we're going to literally take all those students aside and teach them the computer skills that other kids have and we're not going to. We don't have enough we don't have enough support to do that. <laughs> I mean, they'll offer a test. I know they'll offer a class because that's what we always do. We throw it out there and say, oh, we're going to offer a training. Um, but those the same families don't go to it. It's the same people that go to it or they don't have the ability to get that training. So I just I want an acknowledgement that we know what we're doing, I guess, yes. that we are definitely not dealing with the equity divide. Well, I, most certainly thank you for your feedback. Um, we did take this um, to the uh, DAC uh, to the the student uh, advisory um, council, and um, the the students there um, they liked the the phased in approach, and because they said the younger kids. Uh, and it, it was a diverse uh, group of students. They said the younger kids coming in behind them um, had more experience with online testing um, than they did uh, at, at a younger age. So that's why we are, are thinking and exploring the phased in approach with, with this plan and not just, you know, you know, coming up uh, uh, this fall. Um, and, and announce, oh, it, it, ACT is completely online. That's that's why we are exploring the the uh, phased in approach, based really on what we the feedback that we uh, received from the student advisory council um, about three weeks ago. Um, I uh, I presented uh, Jennifer Stafford and I presented to them, and that was that was their uh, feedback was uh, because of the younger younger ones coming in behind them, they do a lot of online testing. And they felt that they would, those students would be more be better prepared for a fully online uh, version of the ACT. So that's like nine years from now, is that what we're saying? Eight or nine years from now? I don't, I don't believe um, eight or nine years, but the, the middle school students coming up, coming up in behind these students here. And I'm, I guess I'm not, I mean, I'm familiar with that group, but I'm not familiar with the diversity of that group, specifically with socioeconomic status, with income. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my biggest concern. Okay. So is that, is, can you speak to the, um, to that group and their socio socioeconomic diversity? Or I, just I don't, the I don't know the group, <laughs> real familiar, uh, but, uh, uh, maybe Helen or, or someone could could speak to to that. But um, I, I know that it was it's a diverse group. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me jump in here. Uh, good morning, Shara and Helen. Uh, and Kelly, thank you very much for um, uh, addressing the very thoughts that, that we are having on um, the transition to um, online testing, um, because we want to take a very um, a approach that is very thoughtful um, going into such um, a decision and uh, moving toward uh, the um, online world. A um, couple of uh, mentioned, um, Shara mentioned the um, the student advisory group. Um, we, we don't know the socioeconomic of, of students um, within that. Uh, that's not something that um, uh, we would uh, have the the privilege of knowing that that type of thing. That's, you know, personal private um, student information that um, we are not access to that uh, for that group. Right. Um, so, but we did hear them. <laughs> we um, we mentioned to them that this uh, this idea because they are the end users of the the system. They are the ones that will be impacted, and we wanted to take it to them first before we get went to any other groups. Um, and if they had have been very uh, discouraging um, instead of encouraging, then we uh, frankly would not have had this sit conversation and we would not have brought forward this discussion with um, uh, SCAC and our other district assessment coordinators that we've um, also been talking with. Um, as Shara mentioned, they had some really good uh, feedback for us. You know, a lot of their um, their comments were positive and encouraging, but they w did so um, cautiously. Um, as Helen mentioned in her presentation, we did have online testing um, for the past couple of years statewide. In 2020, we did have the field test, and then in 2021, we had the um, the online assessments. And what the students said is that um, as they get more and more experience with online testing, the better they are becoming with it is basically what uh, that we heard. And the fact that the students that are coming behind them, uh, whether they be uh, their, you know, whether they're in their sophomores, whether they're juniors, whether there are you know eighth graders, we don't test at the, the freshman level statewide, um, that they are experiencing more and more online and that they were encouraging this to say you know this is um, uh, a situation that the students the younger students will have more experience with and therefore be more uh, willing to um, uh, move in that direction um, and, and so uh, they also were uh, mentioning the fact that uh, they didn't want to jump right into it. Uh, the fact that um, they were very cautious um, about stepping into the, the online is um, and having more experiences with the tools. Um, as Shara mentioned, it's the same ACT system. The ACT uses the same system as we are uh, moving forward with our Kentucky Summative Assessment. So that is um, some advantages for our students so that it's not different programs or different platforms that they would be using and utilizing uh, for the ACT. Uh, so all of those pieces um, we feel like that are, are encouraged by um, to support all of our students toward um, toward the online, but uh, appreciate very much those those comments and um, other comments for for the ACT. Yeah, I think I really appreciate your comments. I guess one of the things that we're paying a lot of attention to at the University of Kentucky and I think in the nation and the DEI group at um, KDE is as well is how we use the term diverse. And it's like kind of our catch all. We're like, we have a diverse group or we talk to a diverse group, but we don't always define what we mean by diverse. And so we know lots of times that, 
and you know this, I know you know this, Jennifer, so I say this more for the, because I mean, I've got a lot, I have a lot of experience working with you and your expertise, but when we get students or get groups together to talk about things, there are certain people that are in those groups, right? And there are certain people that are not in those groups, that are not represented in those groups. And so um, I'm just I'm just very concerned about the not represented individuals and, um, you know, and Teresa's point about technology. I mean, there's a lot of things that um, that go into this. So I guess my big like my takeaway question is, is like, is the push to do this to save time and money or do you really think this is best for students is this really the best way to test students or is this really basically the most cost effective and the most way to capture the most data so I'll, I'll I'll speak to it and then Shara may have other ideas too. Well, there's no cost benefit for Kentucky. There's no cost savings. There's there's nothing like that. So uh, it's for the benefit of the, the students. Um, in that there are um, you know multiple um, um, advantages for the the students, um, being the fact that they get their um, information back quicker. There are uh, also um, pieces in the My ACT that connect them to um, online materials and online um, like uh, interest surveys and that connect them to the uh, careers and, and scholarships and things that they would uh, be then qualified for. Um, the other thing too is we we felt like that um, you know, this is going to be their future uh, when they get to um, um, post-secondary or they get to um, their their next step in their their life after high school. That um, a lot of the the processes and will be online, whether if it's in the classroom or whether it's in um, their work world. So we're really trying to think. Okay, so how is their world going to be when they get out of of high school too i i appreciate that yeah and the the suggestion i would have is to make sure they're educated on using those tools because we have a very high acceptance rate at some of our in-state schools but the students that are taking the online go ahead and click submit their scores and if they have a terrible test assessment that day, it's very detrimental to their application process. But no one talks them through what it means to do those interest inventories, to hit yes in my scores to these schools. And again, that's another advantage of, you know, different kind of family approaches to these testing. But we, um, of the small percentage that we, um, weren't accepted at some of the institutions. I mean, we haven't done all the analysis, but a couple of my colleagues and I are looking at this. Lots of those students chose to submit ACT scores that were not required to be submitted, and they were awful scores, and they would have been accepted otherwise. Um, and so I think knowledge on how to use those online tools is critical. And again, that's that's a gap that we're seeing. The students that don't submit scores are definitely more economically advantaged because they're not worried about saving the eight dollars right to send the scores later if they're not good um, and the other students that are trying to save money just hit yes yeah, submit to these schools and they end up getting you know 17 on their first take and schools are like they're not even ready for college and they get kicked out of the loop when they didn't even have to even submit their scores to even be considered so that would those are just the bigger picture things that I really want people to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for bringing that perspective. Yes, Kelly, that, that I, I do. does help. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just let me, uh, Kelly, that will help me in my trainings um, this fall um, that we do to whether we go paper or online. Either way, that my ICT is out there and I can, I can help, uh, you know, train and uh, lead people uh, to train their students and educate their students. So thank you for that feedback. That's very valuable. I, I do think that that and of course I, I can't speak necessarily statistically um, as, as Kelly can. I, can. I guess I can speak a little bit because I'm getting old, but I mean, even back from from 07, you know, we were we were given. I remember giving the map test in 07 and, and it kind of 
uh, with Teresa's point, we were we were trying to use hardwired computers, and it took us 15 days, and and all of that. But but I think about that group, and that group's graduated, and so even even back then, that was middle schoolers that I was working with. Um, we have students who've graduated who've been online testing for for years. I, I do think that it's it's very rare um, anymore for our students to sit down and take paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. uh, assessments um, at, at our level where we consider STAR, if we consider MAP or, or any other type of, of ongoing assessment that we give in our, our buildings and now we're transitioning our state assessment to it. And and I say that knowing that uh, I, I spoke to our counselor while you guys were were, uh, were presenting because she was involved in the pilot and I, I, I wanted to, to get her feel and she said from an administration standpoint she, she absolutely loved it. I, I, I say this knowing I've got a couple of our teachers who might punch me later because they they like they're very comfortable with the paper pencil and, and they've they've often worked with our students on how to approach the test and, and how to use the test booklet and things like that and so i do appreciate that it's a phased approach because it's going to be a comfort level not only for students but for adults who've been working for kids we have some fantastic folks who have a great understanding of how to assist them in preparation for the act um and, and so i think that that time and, and helping for that transition and how that looks differently i think it's really important uh, for our adults to have a, a good understanding of how that looks and and how that's going to look differently than the 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 uh, the the written version, but I do think I think our students um, and I'm in a small district. I think back to Kelly's point, it's 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 really easy for me to sit here and say as long as we can test on Chromebooks and and I can get kids a Chromebook home and they can they can go practice their ACT work and and things like that. I can say that it'd be very unfair for me to say. I think every district in Kentucky can do that, but I do think that that our districts are working really hard to prepare kids for online models. Um, I remember taking the GRE back in uh, whatever year it was a long time ago now, and it was online. Uh, mm -hmm. It was one of the first times I'd ever tested online. But mm -hmm. I, but I do believe that that now our our students are probably more familiar and more comfortable uh, in an online setting uh, mm -hmm. than they are in the paper pencil. Uh, just just from my experience, that's across since '07. I was blessed to be in three districts that were very different. Um, one county school district that was much more rural, and then um, an independent district that was about a thousand more than I have now. And so I've, I've gotten to see it kind of in those settings. And I do think our our, our students are are adjusting well to the online version. And and so, I, but I, I do appreciate that it's kind of a phased in approach to give them that opportunity to transition there. Right. I just want to quickly agree to that I, I'm in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and we have a very high um, socioeconomic level, very small district. So I often think things shouldn't be as hard as they are. And when you go to different places or bigger areas, it does change the dynamic completely. My mom works in Fayette County and often says to me, you know, we we can't space out like you do. We don't, we have buses and you don't. And so there are so many different factors across the board. And I think that you would see that in, in technology as well. We are one-to-one -one and it's easy for us to get everybody in a position to take a test online, but it would be a lot more difficult if we weren't, um, we wouldn't have those resources. So I, I can see how that is an important thing to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Anyone else? If, if we really want to uh, <clears throat> meet um, students where they are culturally and techno technologically, uh, has your office considered partnering with TikTok? Um, not to my knowledge. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's, it's really the bane of our existence right now. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate uh, we appreciate what you had to say about technology, and it, it is a difficult transition. I'll, there's a lot to take into consideration, um, as Dr. Bradley pointed out. Um, and so it's, it, it's interesting to me as a as a history teacher that um, a lot of those challenges are the same challenges that we encountered, you know, a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, with the our, our very first standardized test with, you know, technology, culture, language, stuff like that. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Savage. Uh, Ms. Jones, I uh, believe uh, we have Dr. Stafford um, next on our agenda. Good to see you, Jennifer. 
Uh, nice to see you, Scott, and everyone. And I just want to say congratulations to you and Casey again. And again, thank you for your leadership on uh, the SCAC. You all play a very important role um, in our um, um, system here. We have uh, we come to you for advice, seeking advice, and um, look uh, forward to your continued leadership. Um, let me. I've got just um, a small presentation just to, to guide me through some of the, the points that I just want to share with you. And let me pull that up. So I just want to, um, or, as a way of updating everyone on the um, the assessment accountability, we are preparing for public release. And with uh, public release, it's coming up very quickly. We've gone through a number of our quality control steps. We've worked with our district assessment coordinators over the past month and a half to provide uh, some overview and review of out of the data and um, we are currently in the stage of preparing the school report card with that uh, assessment data uh, as a reminder this these are some points that um, Rhonda and I made with you the last time but it just as a reminder as we're getting closer to public reporting there's no accountability indicators there are going to be no ratings such as stars or descriptive words like proficient or distinguished or needs improvement schools things of that nature as you recall um, the kentucky department of education applied for and received uh, approval from the u.s department of education on waiving uh, uh, accountability for the spring of 21. now where they were willing to waive accountability uh, they were not willing to waive assessment so uh, last spring we did uh, have um, an extraordinary effort from our local districts and school staff uh, that made uh, incredible efforts to administer state assessments to the students um, within the schools as you recall um, none of our state assessments have remote options so all of those state assessments had to be provided in person. So last spring, the school and districts were offering a, a multitude of learning strategies, including in person, remote or completely remote or a hybrid between remote and uh, in person. So the students who were in person during the school year uh, in the spring took the assessments or were expected to take the assessments. So the results that will be presented uh, here in the next couple of weeks will be based on the assessed students. So those students that were in the building uh, during the time frame. So that participation um, is important to know. It's important to know the students who did take the assessments and those students who did not take the assessments. We, we had, again, uh, a really good participation participation rate um, given the circumstances that we were in at the time. The addition to the participation rate that will be presented, there will be some performance as well. So there'll be performance results uh, in 2021 uh, state assessments. There will also be graduation rates. The graduation rate for four year and five years um, students because students did graduate last year um, and so uh, those will be included there will uh, also be for the first time publicly these uh, quality of school climate and safety survey in 2020 back in 2020 as K Helen mentioned earlier we had a very successful um, field test of reading and math and um, on-demand writing and editing mechanics. Um, during that field test, it was online. And um, we also administered the, the two constructs of the quality of school climate and safety survey, which were safety and climate. Unfortunately, because of the closure due to the pandemic, our students in alternate 
assessment program were unable to take that quality of school climate and safety survey and because of uh, their in voices were not part of that survey those results uh, were not made public because their uh, voices are very important to be included and so those the climate and safety surveys were not publicly released last year. Um, this year, we were able uh, for the in the spring of 21, able to get all of the students who again were in person uh, administer the survey and uh, it included uh, what we're calling opportunity to learn items. Um, those opportunity to learn items were uh, questions. There were seven questions. Uh, um, and there were two forms of that survey, one for three through fifth graders and one for six through 12th graders. Um, and only those students who are in tested grades took the um, climate and safety survey. So those students that were are in tested grades, uh, statewide assessments took the survey. Those items for opportunity to learn range from things like when when my my school was closed, I had access to teachers or I felt good about what I learned during the non traditional instructions and things of that nature, because we thought it was important to come to an understanding of how students who are again impacted by the pandemic and those um, instructional modes uh, felt about the pandemic and what they learned last year. So those will be um, included in the school climate and safety survey results publicly. Uh, now the responses to those uh, items include um, a range from um, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. So that range of um, from strongly agree to strongly disagree will be presented uh, publicly. So that gives a little bit of context uh, to the results and how students felt about how they um, learned last year. It's going to be again important uh, for individual schools and districts to provide their stories about the instructional settings uh, that they were in last year. Um, the results could be impacted uh, because of those learning disruptions that we had during the um, pandemic. So as you recall, the schools were closed uh, for uh, a lot of the year. Um, there were access to technology. We've talked about that a couple of times this morning that um, the uh, different schools were able and have the capacity um, for technology. Um, across and there were it were different experiences by students so uh, that could impact student performance on the state assessments and also the access to learning support such as after school tutoring and um, response to interventions um, those were all also could have been impacted um, from the pandemic and then in turn have an impact on student performance for the the assessments um, the test itself uh, changed as well. So the, the modifications uh, that were allowed by the US Department of Education um, were, were multiple and we were able to take uh, advantage of the shortened form of the assessments. Um, we wanted to uh, focus on instruction because we knew that the students had not been in person uh, for a lot of the, the school year. So we really wanted to uh, limit the time that it took um, students to take the assessments. Um, so the shortened form uh, could have impact on uh, the results. In addition, we also um, we shifted our standards and um, testing uh, the new standards. As as we mentioned, um, the Kentucky academic standards. We uh, transitioned the 2021 um, school year um, to use old assessment items, so previously used uh, assessment items on those new standards. So uh, those uh, that shortened form with those items that uh, coded to both old and new standards uh, could impact the student performance. 
We also, um, with our participation rates across the districts, we uh, could see, uh, de again, the decreased participation rate uh, that could impact student performance. And we also see um, uh, districts will want to look at who took the assessment and who didn't take the assessment because it could be uneven. And what I mean by that is that um, you could have uh, some groups of students um, that are um, uh, were able to participate um, by increased numbers where others groups didn't. Uh, for example, in the example I've used um, previously is that you know you may have uh, all of your boys uh, take the assessment but not your girls. Uh, and that could impact uh, your assessment results. So looking at who did and who didn't take the assessment is going to be important to take that. So just uh, as, uh, as a uh, way of providing more about the upcoming release of uh, public assessment, state assessment data, uh, we are calling the assessment from spring 2021. We're going to go ahead and transition it to be called the Kentucky Summative Assessment. Um, so Kentucky administers state assessments, and those were for the 2021 school year uh, called, uh, we're going to call those in this uh, upcoming release, the Kentucky Summative Assessment, because those items were on new standards using those older items. So the what we had previously called K prep, we are going to go ahead and uh, transition the spring 21 assessment to uh, the Kentucky summative assessment uh, for the upcoming release. So again, those current standards, those newest standards that we've had in reading and math and uh, on demand writing, uh, became operational using those old uh, assessment items or those previously used assessment item. Now science has been called the Kentucky Summative Assessment for a number of years because we have transitioned those um, assessments to those new science standards um, and actually the new science standards are becoming uh, getting into the the timeline for them to be reviewed and possibly revised. So we're using 2021 as a bit of a transition to the Kentucky Summative Assessment. Um, and um, since we were able to uh, utilize those older items or those previously used items, we're able to maintain uh, the definition of novice, apprentice, proficient, and distinguished. So we were able to keep those um, the same cut scores. So with public reporting in any of the, the media release, and um, the public release resources that the Office of Assessment and Accountability has created, those will reference the name Kentucky Summative Assessment. The timeline for public reporting. Um, so Monday, this coming Monday, the 27th, um, state assessment data will be released to uh, districts, uh, district leaders under embargo. So at that point, the district leaders can then begin to uh, work internally um, with uh, leaders in, uh, in schools and districts and begin to discuss internally um, what the data is, um, what the data actually are uh, within the schools and districts. The 28th, which is next Tuesday, will, the school report card will be open to media under embargo, and that's working media only. In order for um, the, the media outlets to be able to discuss then with district leaders and school leaders the, the data, prepare their stories, and uh, be able to then run those on September 29th, which will be the public release of the school report card. Now, beginning on the 29th, there'll be a review uh, that what we call the 10 day regulatory review period, where if there are individual student changes that need to be made, um, that it can be made after then that public release of school data. And that uh, runs then again, beginning the 29th and will run for 10 days. 
Now, I want to note for you that um, there is going to be data that are suppressed um, it, it, within the school report card. We've always had that before, but in the summer of 2020, the Kentucky Department of Education underwent a review from the U.S. Department of Education. It was a monitoring visit, and um, the, the, the department does this on a regular basis because of our the title funds that the state receives they will monitor um, our title programs to see that we are adhering as a state to the statutory and regulatory language that the department puts out and so um, with that review they uh, will come back with some uh, suggestions uh, that uh, are more like requirements that um, that state should adhere to. So with uh, with the some of their uh, requirements, the Kentucky Department of Education will suppress a, a bit more data uh, with the upcoming release. So you may find that there is not um, uh, as much data in the school report card uh, under assessment data as there has been in the past. Um, as just a reminder, um, some reasons why data are suppressed, uh, especially since if there are fewer than 10 students in a grade. Um, if there are situations where groups of students have perform at the same uh, performance level. So in the example I have here on the slide, if all the Hispanic students uh, in the school perform at the proficient level, then that would you would be able to from the general public determine what the students that are Hispanic got in that particular uh, grade or uh, subject area. So those in those situations, then if there is the ability to de determine that student score, then the data will be suppressed. Um, if there's a, as another example, if there are performance levels that have no students, um, in the case that, uh, in that case, then all the student performance for the school would be suppressed at that grade level in that subject. So, for example, if all of our Hispanic students, um, or, or all of the students in that grade, for example, uh, reading, uh, uh, no one scored novice, then that grade level and subject then would be suppressed. Um, also, if if it's a way that um, by using uh, an algebraic formula or a matter of deduction that you can determine that the individual student score it will be uh, will be suppressed. And again, uh, we have situations where we have very small schools and um, that school district uh, school performance could be suppressed. Um, and then when you get aggregated up to the district, that could also be suppressed as well. So, for example, if a district has an A5 school, um, say it uh, at the high school level and only one high school, the in the high school data um, is presented in the school report card and the A5 is suppressed, then it's po a possibility that the information would have to be suppressed at the district level because when you add together that one high school, that A5, to aggregate it to the district level, you would be able to determine the students in that A5 school and what their performance was. So again, just want to mention that uh, data uh, in the school report card uh, may be more suppressed than you've seen it in previous years. So just want to give you that that forewarning. And um, what we're, we're, we're really talking through is um, that our our assessment that we gave this year is more of a um, kind of a, a, a one off assessment. Um, as I mentioned, we're transitioning um, from uh, like one assessment system to uh, a fuller um, assessment of the, the new standards in the fact that there will be um, in the 2022 uh, new items uh, based on those current current standards. And so we're really um, looking at this um, this year as a transition from the old to the new 
uh, assessment. So let me pause there. That was a, a lot of information and see if uh, anyone has um, information or, or want to share or question. Hey, Jennifer, uh, you referenced a student survey uh, early on in your presentation. Yes. When might that data be available? Is that part of that September release? It is. It is. The uh, quality of school climate and safety um, information is going to be part of the public release. Um, the information that will be shared uh, to schools and districts um, and the public will be aggregated. Um, so that um, student responses, individual student responses are uh, not uh, able to be determined. So um, now with the assessments like your, your Kentucky Summative Assessment or your um, access, your alternate access, um, those assessments, the schools and districts receive those individual scores. So all the, the information that although it may be suppressed publicly, the schools and districts get the information uh, about those grades and those um, students. Um, you just can't put those out publicly um, for uh, the general public on the, those in, on, on a, the assessments. But the the school climate and safety those will be um, presented both publicly and to the schools and district in aggregate. Because you wouldn't want uh, the you want the the students to be truthful in their responses. And if they thought the school may know what they are answering, they may not be as truthful. Oh, sure. Uh, do we have any other questions for Dr. Stafford? I do have a general question. Of course, I have all the data since I'm I'm DAC. But statewide, just participation wise, did KDE see the same pattern of participation um, by level? So did elementaries all tend to have participation close to the same level in the middle school and high school, or did it just vary all over the place in the state? Um, so, you know, the, the data is under, are under embargo at this point. Um, the uh, very broad question kind yes, of. Yes, it is a very broad question. <laughs> um, let me say that our schools and districts, they they did make an extraordinary uh, effort to um, to get the students tested. You know, we we saw varying degrees of uh, participation um, across grade levels. Uh, there there were variations in that. Um, uh, and um, you'll see that there are um, um, differences uh, among the, the um, both the levels and the student demographic groups. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Again, always good to see you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, that being said, um, does anybody have a motion for adjournment? Uh, before you get there, Scott, I do sure. want to mention um, we have had some um, some indication that new appointments um, are pending for SCAC. Um, we have received the fact that there are some um, paperwork that is being finalized that we could see new appointments for our, our members who are uh, scheduled to um, drop off of the um, due to the rotation. And so uh, we're not making any formal formal pre announcement or anything like that other than the to say that we have seen some movement on uh, appointments and if that happens we will definitely contact you joy will be in contact um, and i just want to say um, if that does happen um, we want to say we appreciate very much everyone's participation in here and we just really appreciate your guidance and your your input and your candor 
on this um, this group because we value your opinions and I feel like that there are um, but we have this trust among us that we can we can talk and share. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. And so if if this happens to be your last uh, meeting, I just just know that that we really appreciate you. The Kentucky Department of Education just values your input and your leadership. Well, well, thank you. Uh, I've, I've certainly uh, appreciated being uh, a part of this process and working with such great people. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see what what's in store there. So, um, I'm hoping to see everybody November sixteenth. But uh, if not, uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> so, we do need a motion, Scott. Yes, ma'am. I make a motion. Follow Jolly. Follow. This is David Trimball, second. All right. All those in favor of uh, adjournment, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right. Well, good to see everybody. Stay healthy. Uh, and uh, again, uh, November 16th is our next scheduled meeting. All right. Thank you. Bye.